Welcome to the video in which I talk about Fallout 3's DLC and give my impressions on it. There's quite a bit of disparity between Fallout 3's various DLCs, and as such they tend to be rated extremely highly or lowly in the community depending on which one you're talking about. From my experience, I remembered these five DLCs bringing a fair amount to the game, but I felt pretty mixed about the actual quests and content. The big thing for me was the level cap that was increased by 10 levels in Broken Steel, which also meant more perks to experiment with. But let's dive into these DLC and see what exactly they have to offer. After Fox disarmed the big explodey water purifier, I casually slip into a coma for two weeks because I guess the light hurt me or something. I'm told that the Brotherhood is in the middle of scrubbing the Enclave from the rest of the map, and that they could use my assistance. The thing is, at this point the most that I've interacted with the Enclave has been at their main base, which blew up. Because honestly, Liberty Prime and the other Brotherhood members killed pretty much every single Enclave soldier before I could even shoot them while we were marching. The Broken Steel DLC really focuses on lots and lots of combat with Enclave forces. And at this point it's actually kind of welcome. If you can't tell a good story, then just let me kill a lot of shit. I was just thinking about it like a Wolfenstein or Metro game at this point. Except it's also extremely fair to note that if XP wasn't ticking at the bottom right, I would probably just run past everything honestly. So take that for what you will. There isn't too much more to this, there's nothing extremely interesting to talk about. Liberty Prime dies due to an orbital strike and everyone is like, oh my god, this fringe group of remaining Enclave soldiers might wipe us out without our big death robot. So you're off to figure out what happened, retrieve a Tesla coil, and save Christmas. Almost the entire thing is non-stop combat. You raid a hideout filled with more Enclave than you've seen in the game until now, fight lots of security robots, and at some point the devs went, oh yeah, Deathclaws, those are really tough enemies, and decided to start throwing 8,000 cubic liters of unregulated killing machine at you. Well, just above us is a Deathclaw research facility. There are also a bunch of robots in the facility. There are also some military types left. There are also- It really is just fighting for a good two plus hours straight. I mean, I guess that's good in a way, because I had over a hundred stim packs for most of the mid to late game, and wound up with 50 by the end of this endeavor. Also, I started using drugs because they're cool. Like I said, the whole thing is overall pretty fun, but there wasn't much in the way of compelling storytelling for the Broken Steel DLC. I just want to know why this airbase wasn't considered the main base since the former one which housed President Eden was comparatively minuscule and underprotected. I guess that's just the breaks when you need to outdo your vanilla game to sell extra content. When all is said and done, you get scooped up by a vertebrate and given a nice compliment for single-handedly decimating the Enclave. Well, okay, maybe double-handedly. You land a whole building away and watch the orbital strike that you set in motion to nuke the Enclave's own base. Then you sit in the back of the vertebrate with no one talking or anything for like 20 seconds really awkwardly. <laughs> like I said, Broken Steel does its job as a combat DLC, and it doesn't compromise its objective to fulfill that gap that the game was lacking previously. It didn't make a big soap opera out of itself, and that's honestly fine by me. Alright, one down, four more DLC to go. I remember not being very fond of the Pit or Mothership Zeta, but let's see how they fare now. We'll start with Zeta because I'm fairly sure that it was the weakest of the five DLC. Alright, the plan here was to sit here and critique everything like I usually do, but Jesus Christ, dude. It's just not worth breaking down that way. It's basically not even a Fallout game at this point. It's just a lesser Halo. I was initially going to go on about how it's ridiculous that this little girl knows everything about how the ship functions, how the aliens don't notice her being gone, how melee weapons seem to do more to them than ranged weapons despite me having like 30 points in my melee, how the entire objective is to just overload the coolant multiple times in multiple devices over and over again, how you go out into space but the outside of the ship still has gravity. The whole thing is just ridiculous. Like, you ever just sit down to watch a movie and then you naturally start picking apart the stupid things that exist in it before you eventually realize, oh, yeah, this movie's supposed to be intentionally outlandish. That's what Mothership Zeta is in this game. 
There's hardly any enemy variants. You're in an alien ship and it still manages to be boring with its infrastructure. And the whole thing logically makes no sense and doesn't even attempt to. You made a DLC about aliens coming down from space. At no point during that should the player be going, geez, how much longer is this shit? It's a B-movie in a Fallout game. I'm just waiting for Will Smith to pop out and jerk off an alien at this point and the film will be complete. <laughs> I'm moving on to the pit now. So, the pit has you starting out by talking to this fella here who tells you that he's an escaped slave from a place surprisingly called the pit, if you could imagine such a thing. Basically, the conditions are so poor in the pit that people straight up biff it from some kind of mysterious pit-related disease. But fortunately, there was a cure that was discovered. Unfortunately, the slavers decide to keep it to themselves, and the slaves had to suffer from the disease. This guy learned about the cure, and then escaped with that knowledge. So now we need to steal this cure before it's perfected, whatever that means, and use it as a bargaining chip for the slaves' lives. Why the slavers wouldn't cure the slaves is beyond me, because if I were in the market for some pre-1865 action, I wouldn't want the slaves that were dying from a mysterious, incurable disease. I want the strong slaves. Wait, this is not, not, let's just, anyways, the plan now is to dress up as a slave and then get into the pit and, I don't know, Russell Crowe my way out of there? My character has 12 IQ. I just like that the guy goes, I know you're thinking that it's a tough world out there and that shit like this happens all the time, but I can free them with your help. Which, let's be honest, if my character at any point was thinking any of that, he'd laugh in this guy's face and then walk away with his super mutant buddy. Anyways, it's slave time, I guess. Gotta pop on the old certified dead guy rags and then walk down the tunnel to my certain death. The first chunk of the pit has you encountering a set of guards. They give your friend here shit for returning, and he says to you, don't worry, let me handle the talking. He proceeds to have a brief chat followed by him swiftly shooting a guy in the head. I mean, I could have handled the talking too, honestly. Either way, the plan from here is to act like a slave who didn't want to be out in the wasteland by himself anymore and has to be taken back into the pit as a slave. The pit actually gets its name from the Pittsburgh Bridge, apparently. And I have to genuinely compliment Bethesda here for recreating circa 2008 Pittsburgh verbatim. You can really see the effort here. At any rate, I really didn't want to play by Bethesda's puppet show for this one, so I tried to fight my way into the pit just to see how it panned out. Well, I got in and promptly got the shit beat out of me with batons. I really don't know how because I can survive landmines pretty easily, but yeah, we'll roll with it. When I woke up, I was told to meet this older lady at her house. I'm not really sure what her role is here, honestly, because she tells me that if the slaves slack off or stand around, they get their asses beat, and yet she's allowed to hang out in her house all day. It's not a hidden house or anything. She lets you know that she's under surveillance 24-7, so I don't really know how she gets away with it. This guy comes in to check on us, and I decided it was time for this gamer to rise up by utilizing close to 13 shots to the head with this actual nerf gun. That pissed off some of the other slavers, but they gave up after I loaded the next area of the pit. So my objective now is to go out and do what is referred to as a death sentence. Nothing about this makes sense because it's explained to you that you're the one that has to save everyone. And then you're sent out to do the hardest job here because, quote unquote, if anyone sees me up close, they'll realize I'm not a real slave. Why would you risk your chances of freedom like that? But anyways, grab 10 ingots, free robots, kill trogs, all that jazz. Upon my return, I meet up with this chick again so that she can tell me the real plan this time. I'm actually going to Russell Crow my way out of the pit. There's an arena, and the slaves that make it through the arena earn their freedom and an audience with the big boss of Camp Laszlo here. So I'm off to fight the three fights required to earn my freedom and then over to Asher. At this point, the whole story is unveiled as this Asher guy being a former Brotherhood of Steel member who was left for dead here in Pittsburgh. He banded scavengers together, started taking slaves, and basically made a base around this working steel mill. Then he banged this scientist so hard that he cured radiation with his baby. The plan was to suck the vaccine clean out of this baby to make more of it so that everyone could gain immunity to the radiation. This all sounds very stupid because it is, but that doesn't stop Fallout 3. So I baby nap this kid and hightail it out of the HQ, assist the slaves in overrunning the bad guys, and deliver the baby to Werner, where he tells me that it's now time to unleash the trogs onto the slavers. I don't know how many more slavers there are at this point, because they all seem to be dead by my hand or by the slaves that attacked with me. But sure, let's release the trogs. 
Oh, also, trogs are humans that are so irradiated that they became feral and vicious. There's no explanation beyond that, they're just another brand of ghoul, I guess. And they hate light. So turning off the floodlights will allow them to run rampant. So I fought my way through the well-lit underground to turn off the floodlights, and then stepped outside to see Asher fighting off the trogs. He didn't register me as an enemy until I started shooting them too, so I popped him and then I started popping trogs for the bonus XP. This quest is dumb. At least the remaining four purple-dyed hair slavers were also overrun by the trogs. I killed most of them before reporting to Warner, where I was told that I now had access to the ammo press and that the slaves were free and everything in the world was great again thanks to my efforts. Even though the slaves at the ammo press were still talking about escaping. I guess no one told them. Oh well, free labor. On to Point Lookout, our second to last stop. This one starts you out talking to a lady who wants you to go find her daughter, who has recently taken a riverboat to Point Lookout. The ferryman is a real prick who sells you tickets to and from Point Lookout for a base price of 300 caps each. Or in my case, 820 total. When you arrive at this smoggy New Jersey dock, the guy tells you that you're in good luck because smoke seems to be billowing from the mansion across the way. Apparently that's a good thing for treasure hunters or something. This whole thing feels like a big, elaborate trap at this point, but off we go skipping to the mansion for some, uh, treasure gathering, I guess. I'm digging the very foggy environment at this point, honestly, and the docks really made me feel like I was in another area of the world. If there's one thing that these DLC have done really well, it's making me feel like I wasn't in the Capital Wasteland anymore. Anyways, I arrive at the mansion here and I'm greeted by an extremely quiet man who's giving me orders to help him. As I make it inside the door, there seems to be a breach by a ton of these natives who are screaming about being impure and stuff like that. So with no extensive interaction, you're thrown against these lunatics who are busting down doors and parts of the ceiling to, I guess, kill the owner and myself now. It's not the worst, I guess, but I really feel like I'm playing a Call of Duty campaign. I guess you could say the same about Broken Steel, but it felt less scripted with that one. Like, okay, so you go through these halls, fighting off psychopaths who are wielding axes, rifles, and double-barreled shotguns. Then you get to the breach, and the guy tells you over the intercom, Alright, look around for something explosive to shoot to seal the breach. Of course, there's a bright red gas furnace thing to shoot, so you do that, and the explosion happens, and he's like, Cool, get to the next part. And then you do the exact same sequence again, complete with a part where you fall through a weak part of the ground and plummet 16 feet through several floors and the announcer's table. Now, again, it's not the worst experience, it's just very on rails, and it really strays from what Fallout should be at this point. It doesn't last long and it ends with you defending the entrance of the mansion while every boarded up section is breached through like goddamn cod zombies. The boards don't even break, they just hover in the air. I think the most offensive part of this entire experience though is how bullet spongy the enemies have become at this point in the game. I am 100% entirely fine with Enclave soldiers wearing full suits of power armor taking a few shotgun blasts to down. I am not okay with literally regular, albeit crazy, humans wearing cloth rags taking two sniper rifle shots to the head and living. I understand that it's a video game, very obviously, and I get that they need to make it harder. But holy shit, these fuckers are doing more damage to me with a knife to my combat armor than I am with a Mountain Dew Baja Buckshot Blast to their bare chests. You have to understand that even in the confines of Fallout 3, I can only shoot twice with a sniper rifle in VATS because it's supposed to be just that powerful. This is with maximum agility too but it's still not strong enough to kill these tribal people without a critical hit. That's just really poor design. Seriously, make them die in one to two shots max and literally throw 50 of them at me at once. I don't care. I just wanna feel like I'm fighting humans, not devil may cry demons. After this string of gamer moments, I finally get to talk to the guy who wrote me into this and he isn't exactly overjoyed about you helping him out. So, my hero. Think you came in and rescued me right in the nick of time? Not hardly. Had it all well in hand, and I didn't even need to use the failsafe. But he still teaches you a perk and asks you if you'd like to figure out why these dudes keep attacking him. 
So I set off to do just that, and again, the environment here is really goddamn cool. It really is kind of a mix between like New Jersey and Louisiana, especially with these hillbilly ass shotgun toting rednecks sitting around with their trailers. When you arrive at this building, the guy on the intercom is excited that you want to join them and tells you that in order to be accepted into the fold, you had to go gather some seeds from the mother of all punga fruit plants. I really did not want to do that, so I tried to see if I could lie to him after waiting for 10 hours, and it didn't work out. But I am really glad that you are forced to do this quest, because it is awesome. First you slog through the swampland with all the ghouls and roll tide hee haws running around with their trucker caps. But then you get to the punga fruit and get a healthy spray of punga nut in your face before passing out for a few moments. When you wake up, everything starts to go to shit as you begin collecting these oversized bobbleheads that tell you that you've really screwed up. You start hallucinating everything from giant saws to the area flipping upside down, to giant sewing needles, to your dead mother on a hospital bed, and finally to the megaton nuke with a fake Mr. Burke standing in front of it before it explodes and you wake up outside of the area. When you return, you find the woman's daughter who you were searching for inside of the mansion. She goes on to inform you that while you were passed out, these guys sawed your skull open, removed part of your brain, and then sewed you back up. Explains the hallucinations from earlier. There are rare moments in games where I read or hear something and I just feel horrible for the character I'm playing, especially if the character is the silent type that only interacts via text. When this girl casually goes, yeah, they sawed your skull open and took out part of your brain, I was like, what the actual fuck? Good lord. She also tells me that the leader here is thinking in his thinking cave, I guess, which is located nearby. After dispatching the local ghouls that are wising from their graves and the Mirelurk squadron, I made it to the top of this cave. Here we find the leader talking to a hologram projection of a talking brain. The brain is obviously fed up and it's basically another Herald situation. The guy's willing to listen, but he thinks the brain is a god, and the brain is telling him that he's a moron and that he just wants the jamming signal in the mansion destroyed so that he can spread his influence across the, across the island. So what it boils down to is these two dickheads who have apparently been at each other's throats for a few centuries now, wanting to kill each other in some way or another. Desmond gives me a jammer to strap onto the ferris wheel to jam the brain's signal. And on my way there, the brain telepathically tells me to throw it away. He didn't tell me what reward I would get, just like Desmond, so I sent the thing up the ferris wheel. Well, that pissed the locals off, so I had to fight them as I headed back to the mansion, where it promptly exploded into tiny pieces. Desmond was safe in his bunker below and tells you that the brain was inside the lighthouse all along. He then leads the charge to said lighthouse. You know, it really is nice to have a companion that moves at a decent rate for once because... Anyways, we make it down to Professor Brain, who again commands me to kill Desmond for a reward that is beyond my wildest imagination. That wasn't specific enough for me, and he's a fucking brain, so I killed him. As it turns out, if I had killed Desmond, my reward was death anyways. So, all's well that ends well. As Big D gives me the key to the vault and tells me to piss off. Not really a pleasant guy. But he did have a nice combat shotgun, and I could use another for repairs, so... After that, it was back to the docks where I was greeted by the orange-haired girl that I was sent here to rescue. As it turns out, she had taken over the ferry after finding out that goddamn Tobar was the asshole who was scooping out people's brains. Again, I don't know what it is about somebody stealing part of your brain, but man, I really wanted to make this guy suffer for this shit. I don't know why she locked him in the engine room with his weapon still, but whatever. I collected the part of my brain that lets me feel happiness and scooted back to the wasteland for one last adventure. Anchorage, Alaska. Home front of the war between the US and the Chinese from the years 2066 to 2077. Also home to the final DLC in Fallout 3 via a simulation. 
The whole thing starts out with me pushing my way into this Brotherhood outcast base. They go, hey, you're not supposed to be here, but come with me anyways. And then you go talk to their leader. The leader tells you that you could be useful because you have a Pip-Boy, which is the only thing that they can think of to activate the simulation and get into the supplies that are locked inside the vault down here. Now, mind you, these guys are probably some of the most arrogant assholes in the game, and that's saying a lot. The Brotherhood outcasts constantly belittle your character whenever you walk by them, no matter which point you're at in the game. They call you a local, they treat you like a subhuman troglodyte at nearly every turn, and then they want your help. Even when you go to get into the pod to help them out, the lady running the damn thing goes, well, you haven't made yourself useful yet, when you ask for just a little respect. The explanation for them being dickheads is that they're stressed out, which, uh, yeah, everyone is. It's a fucking wasteland. It's a post-apocalyptic wasteland. What the, what, kind of, what the fuck kind of excuse is that? There's an important lesson here. Somewhere. Anyways, into the simulation. Which of course comes with the stipulation of, if you die in the game, you die in real life, man. You come to consciousness on these Alaskan mountains, with a very small amount of weapons and armor to work with. You're told that the mission is to infiltrate this Chinese-ran base and take out the three artillery units that are firing onto the US Army. The whole thing is again another DLC that doesn't feel like a Fallout game at all. I mean, it is much more fun than Mothership Zeta at the very least. You don't get to loot enemies, you don't get stim packs or healing items, you just gotta make do with a different weapon, ammo, and health stockpile sprinkled along the way. This means that if you do decide to cowboy your way around the map and get lit up, you're screwed until you can find a health station. Not the worst system, and it reminded me of a lesser Wolfenstein in the same way that Broken Steel did. Maybe more so with the finding weapons around the map thing. Also, there were intel cases to find only furthering that point. After you bomb all three artillery cannons, you're warped away to the main base where the general tells you the next three things that you have to do. I don't know what's up with this game and the three things that you have to do in the DLCs, but apparently no one told Bethesda that the game's name doesn't have to influence them so much. At least I was having a decent amount of fun. Nothing really gets my American blood pumping like taking out some goddamn commies. Before proceeding to the next three objectives, I was told to assemble my team. I had before me five soldier fun bucks to spend on three soldiers for this cause. For my elite squad of commie crushers, I decided to choose a Mr. Gutsy and a Sniper. They perished almost immediately during the first fight. But I didn't really need them. The first leg of the journey involved pretty standard stuff and ended with me securing a Chinese listening post. The second part had me blowing up some more stuff, although this time they were fuel tanks for the Chinese army's Camara tank units. And then the final part had me running through the trenches to deactivate the pulse field and finally kill their general. Now, I know I didn't go into a ton of detail with all of this, but there really wasn't a lot to mention. The enemy types were semi-varied with invisible dragoon units, spider mines that crawled at you quickly, and missile launcher units which were more about making speeches dedicated to their general than actually firing their missiles at you. It was a short DLC, but it was fun for what it was. Plus, you can convince the Chinese general to commit Japanese suicide for whatever reason. And that's it. That's Operation Anchorage. When you get out of the simulation, you're told to put in the code for the armory and to take whatever you want. You're also given a very lukewarm thanks, I guess, from the science lady. Hey, at least you get some really rad power armor that has no downsides to it besides the weight, just in time for the end of the game. And that's about it as far as the meat of the DLCs go. I realized that there's a few side quests which I omitted, which stemmed from Broken Steel and Point Lookout, but I think I played enough to make a fair assessment. Overall, Broken Steel is a fine DLC that adds enough to the game to make up for any of its transgressions, and definitely worth going through. Point Lookout is fantastic, definitely my favorite of all of them, bullet spongy enemies aside. I enjoyed the pit more than when I first played, and I think that's probably because I didn't bother trying to collect all of the steel ingots in the yard this time. It's also a fine DLC which adds more to the game than it takes away. Operation Anchorage is an underwhelming DLC that I would be more impressed with if it was just part of the vanilla game, honestly. It's alright for what it is, but it's very short and very anticlimactic. If Steam mixed reviews were still a thing, that's what I'd give it. And Mothership Zeta? Mothership Zeta is an abomination, a goddamn insult to the game, the series, and probably other series too. I want my life back, Todd. Thanks for watching. 
Fallout 3's DLC is an extremely mixed bag of highs and lows, and it was interesting to see such a strong contrast between them. If you plan on checking out the game and haven't already, I'd recommend only running through three or four of them, obviously. Anyways, I do the thing where I play games live on Twitch, I do the thing where I say a thing on Twitter, and I incubate a very intelligent discussion about a variety of topics on my Discord. Have a good one.